Our next presenter here is Frank Ray. Frank, Frank is the Southeast Region Senior Coatings Consultant for Greenman Peterson. He is an SSPC and NACE Certified Protective Coating Specialist, NACE Level 3 Certified Inspector, and degree chemist with over 20 years of experience providing coating consultant, consulting and inspection services for over 300 bridge and other steel structures. He's performed coating condition assessments, evaluates coating materials, presents maintenance recommendations, right specification, and is well versed in lead abatement. He's also conducted investigations into coating failures to determine cause and present remediation recommendations. He's a certified instructor for several SSPC and NACE coatings and certification courses. And uh, sounds like when he's not inspecting bridges, he likes to fish in the Tampa Bay. So let's welcome Frank and looking forward to it. Thank you, Dan. Good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday. That is bright. Uh, I've got about 20 minutes to summarize a two-year project, so please forgive me if it's a little bit fast-paced. But I would like to go over some of the highlights of the metalizing of the Stickney Point drawbridge in Sarasota, Florida. So let's talk about what is metalizing. It's also known as thermal spray coating, and it's where you apply a molten metal uh, to the steel substrate. Uh, there are several different uh, metals or alloys that you can use depending on the situation. There's advantages and disadvantages to each. The most common is 100% zinc, 100% aluminum, or an 85% zinc and 15% aluminum alloy. And the way the metallizing works is very similar to your inorganic zinc rich primers and your galvanizing. It provides galvanic protection. So what are the characteristics of metallizing? I was uh, surprised to find out it's rather porous. In fact, I missed that, that question on my quiz, one of my courses I took. Uh, it is not a dense metal uh, layer. It's because you're kind of micro splattering the metal on there. You've got some voids, and you'll see later, I'll talk about, you have to seal it. It is very durable. It's very impact resistant and abrasion resistant, which is an advantage when you're handling the steel and erecting the steel. Um, it's heat resistant, chemical resistant. It is acid sensitive because it is a metal. Uh, one of the other thing is it, it doesn't look very nice. So you might want to put a finish coat over. It's got a dull mottled gray appearance. The application is a little bit slower than liquid coating, but as a, you'll see later, the overall operation is shorter. And uh, lastly, it's high initial cost, but it lasts 50 plus years. So if you average it over the life cycle, it actually is, is less expensive. It has a very long service life. The components, there's been some major advancements in field metallizing equipment. Uh, used to be the field metallizing wasn't even practical because the equipment was so large, but now it's, it's just a power supply and your, your material, your powder or your wire, compressed air, and the flame or arc gun, the arc being the most common. And basically, as you can see through these gears, a wire is fed through, through the gears into the gun. There's a very high potential applied to that. When the wires touch, they arc and melt the, the, the wire instantaneously and the compressed air sprays it onto the substrate. We started the, the project um, with a coatings condition assessment. We wanted to see what we had out there and what our options were. Basically, the bridge is located uh, in a coastal area, which is ISO 12944 uh, Marine Coastal. And it's also described as an SSPC Environmental 2B, which is frequently wet by salt water. Some of the other uh, project-specific issues that had to de be dealt with was there were marinas, restaurants, and residents right up on the bridge. So we had to worry about environmental and public relation concerns. This is also a uh, only way on and off of the island, so we had to be ready, prepared in case of a hurricane and we had to coordinate with the Coast Guard because it's a navigable waterway. Another unique design of this bridge is that uh, the counterweights dip into the salt water every time the bridge is opened. So we had to make some special considerations for that. When you do a drawbridge, you also have some special issues that you need to deal with. 
Uh, you can't damage the machinery or the electrical systems, uh, so you've got to be careful if you're going to brace a blast. Also, um, it's ideal to schedule deck the grading replacement at the same time you do a coatings job because that's the only time you're going to get really good access to the tops of the floor beams. Uh, in this case, though, it wasn't scheduled for replacement, so we had to come up with a procedure for getting the top of the floor beams uh, surface prepped and coated through the grading. You also have to deal with opening and closings. The, the drawbridge still has to operate, so you have to schedule to coordinate the work around the openings and the closings. When we did the field evaluations, we did some poking around, did some tests to see what our options were for the maintenance coating. Uh, in the case of the eastbound bridge, I was very surprised to find that there were only two coats of paint on it. And it was, rather, it was rather thin. Your typical bridge coating system goes about 12 to 15 mils. This was only uh, between 6.2 and 8.6 mils. Uh, we had corrosion approximately 5 to 8 percent of the surface area. And the adhesion varied from a 0A, meaning all the paint came off when you tested it, to a 5A where nothing came off. So it, the, the adhesion of the existing uh, coating system in places was suspect, and therefore you might not be able to overcoat. And because of the Florida sun, the, the UV degradation, the, the top coat, there was significant chalking, and the coating was, was rather brittle. And, and when you cut in it to, into it to do the adhesion test, it kind of powdered. Uh, on the westbound bridge, we had the full three coat system, 12 to 20 mils. There was only about three to, point, uh, three to five percent corrosion on it, uh, but you, as you can see that there was uh, some difficulty with peeling of the top coat, and again, significant chalking and brittleness and, and powdering of the, of the top coat because of the UV. So once we did the condition assi assessment, we went into the design phase, and what we needed to do was first is, is determine the scope of the work. Although three to, to eight, 10 percent corrosion doesn't sound like a, that it would warrant full removal and placement, the distribution of the rust, uh, the thinness of the coatings on the eastbound bridge, and the suspicion, uh, the suspect adhesion of the top coats and the extensive degradation of the existing coating as far as it being brittle and powder, we decided that it wasn't a good idea to overcoat this bridge. So we recommended to the Florida DOT to do a full removal and replacement of the existing coating system. Now, we suggested metallizing because in, it's like a fire and forget missile. If you do it right, um, I'll be retired. I'll probably be in the ground before they have to go back out and redo bridge because it has a 50 plus years uh, corrosion protection. The advances in the portable equipment allow you to do it in the field now. Uh, it decreases the number of future maintenance projects because even if it is cheaper to, to use liquid coating, there are other indirect costs such as the administrative cost of, of putting, out, putting it out for bid, awarding the bid and such, review of all the submittals. There's the inconvenience to the public, the lack of the use of the bridge. So there's a lot of indirect, intangible costs that are involved. So you don't want to be going back out there every 15, 20 years. You'd rather just go out there once every 50. And the other thing is, in Florida, we have extreme humidity and, and high heat, extreme temperatures. And liquid coatings, you can't always paint in Florida. So the metallizing pretty well has uh, very little if no dew point restriction or humidity restrictions. The basis of the design was to take the standard specification for maintenance painting, which is section 561, and then augment it with the joint standard on metallizing that SSPC, AWS, and NACE put out. So what are some of the requirements that are different from, from paint? You have to get the surface a much cleaner. You have to do the, the most extreme blasting, and that is a NACE 1 or SSPC SP5 white metal blast. Metallizing also, because it's a mechanical adhesion rather than a chemical adhesion, you have to have a deeper profile. Uh, the, the guy, or excuse me, the, the joint standard uh, recommends a minimum of 2.5 mils. 
Also, the contractor and applicator pre-qualification. Again, this is not, um, this is an art, this is a craft. So the applicators are tested at the beginning of the project and then they are randomly tested through the duration of the project where they have to prepare sample coupons and pass adhesion and bending tests. And this is so that you can make sure that the applicator knows what they're doing. The metallizing goes on at about 8 to 12 mils and it's applied by multiple, multiple passes. The other difference between uh, metallizing and paint is you have to work a small area. If you, if you try to apply it to more than a three by three foot area at, the, at a time, the metallizing cools, the, the, the previous pass of the metallizing cools too much so the subsequent pass is not going to adhere to it. You kind of have to build up this metal and you'll get cohesive failure if you try to do too much of an area at one time. The distance from the substrate again would also be important. You've got to keep a constant close distance of the gun to the substrate again so that the metal doesn't cool, it stays malleable. Some of the other key issues on this project, um, I'm definitely not going to go into the specifics uh, of the soluble salts. Bobby did a magnificent job of covering that. Uh, as with any bridge painting project, you have your sharp edges uh, and difficult to access areas, things like edges, connections, and fasteners that need special attention. Uh, the blasting, metallizing, and sealing has to occur in the same shift. Now this is a disadvantage if you've got openings and closings and traffic control, so you have to work around that, but it's an, an advantage because typically a bridge liquid coating system is three coats. It might take as long as a week between coat. You have, you have to put the blast and the primer on. You have to let the primer cure, then the intermediate coat, let the intermediate coat cure, and such. It could take a week just to do one span. Whereas with the metallizing, you blast, you metallize, you seal in one day, and then you can come back the next day and put the top coat on. Um, the other thing is uh, Florida DOT has made uh, some improvements by adding, requiring the caulking of all uh, crevices and cracks, uh, any um, connections so that we can avoid water intrusion. Uh, again, the anchor profile is different for coating. It has to be a little bit de deeper. Another uh, trend in, in the Florida bridge coating is they've gone to a, a UV resistant clear coat which has increased the gloss and color retention. So we decided to use that on this project also. And then during the, uh, the inspection, you can do the metallizing just like you do any other liquid coating. You can use a dry film thickness gauge. So what were some of the lessons learned on this project? Well, we found out it's not recommended for an incentive decentive contract. This contract was put out with a bonus for finishing early and a penalty for finishing late. So every time there was a, uh, a request for information or a request for a change from the contractor, uh, the design team was under uh, quite a bit of pressure to either allow them to do it, not to slow them down, or to at least get the, the problem worked out as quickly as possible. And that's not usually uh, in the best interest of the final product. So the change, any changes are under restraint when you have an incentive decentive contract. We also, uh, you, when you do your assessment, you want to identify if there's any flame hardened edges. Because you can abrasive blast them all day long. You're not going to get a profile on a flame cut edge. It has to be ground down by hand tools first and then abrasive blast to get the profile. And uh, it turned out that that was going to be a change order that was going to cost uh, much more than it was worth. So we ended up having to do the flame hardened edges with a, an aluminum epoxy mastic, uh, a surface tolerant coating. Again, the counterweights, they dip into the water, so they needed special treatment. Uh, originally, we specified a, a coal tar epoxy. That's the workhorse for, for submersion service. But being that close to the restaurants and the marinas and such, um, the possible odor problems, uh, we, we didn't want to have to deal with that. And then again, the other thing is coal tar epoxy, it, 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 it fades because it's an epoxy and you, you wouldn't have a very good aesthetic appearance in this vacation paradise. 
So the contractor actually offered not to have to deal with the, the problems with the coal tar epoxy. Um, they offered to metalize the frames of the counterweights with no extra cost. Now, I mentioned before, it's imperative with metalizing, especially in a submersion uh, environment, that it be sealed. And so, and because anywhere that there ever was a breach, if there was any pinholes at all in the sealer, the metalizing, that would become a hot spot. It would actually corrode faster than if, it, if there wasn't anything there at all. So we required holiday testing uh, for, the, for the counterweights. Uh, the also, the, the contractor recommended an alternate, alternate sealer, and mainly it was because of the recode time. The typical ultra-high solids epoxy uh, takes about 16 hours before you can put on the next coat. So we used a regular fast cure epoxy and thinned it and got a recode time of about eight hours. And again, though, 100% holiday detection testing was a condition of approval of this change order. I mentioned before, when you do draw bridges, doing the floor beams under the deck grating is always a problem. And the other thing, the restrictive lane closures prevented metalizing the tops of these floor beams. So basically what we did was they, they blasted the floor beams. Um, you know what, I have to correct myself. On this project, the deck was removed. So we did, we did have the opportunity to get a good blast on top of those, uh, those flanges. We just weren't able to, we didn't have the time to do metalizing. So they used two coats of an aluminum epoxy mastic. And one major problem of this project was though that the contractor allowed uh, too much time between blasting the floor beams and applying the coating and they ended up having to go back and do it again. When you're doing these type of projects, you want to pay special attention to identifying uh, limited access areas, places that where, where you cannot do metallizing. Uh, and basically, it's just so you don't slow the project down. It doesn't become an issue. Uh, so you, as you can see, this is one of the locking mechanism cabinets. And we did a change order to where they weren't required to metallize inside there. The other thing is metalizing, again, it, it is expensive and, and it, it's uh, an art and everything. So you want to identify the easy to maintain areas. And we decided that it wasn't uh, a good idea to metalize the hand railings and the steel guard rails because you can have a maintenance crew just go up there with a bucket of paint and a brush and touch it up at any time. So the cost of the metalizing wasn't really imperative. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you. Are, are there any questions? We've, we've painted a few drawbridges in the last few years, probably. We painted three, we got another one coming up. And uh, the hard to access areas is always a problem. So even with the blast, you can't get a blaster into a lot of the nooks and crannies around the drawbridge. So how did they, did they just power tool clean them? What was the, uh, what was the process like identifying those areas and then figuring out what to do with them? Uh, that's a very good question, Dan. Uh, on these rehab projects, blasting actually reveals some of the, some of the areas too. Uh, and what we have is we have an experienced, uh, qualified inspector that's there all the whole time, and they relay the the information, you know, pictures or whatever, or have the the, the designer, myself, or someone come out, and they, they make the decisions as they go. And it's basically whatever's the best uh, practical way to do it. Uh, needle guns, uh, power wire brushes, and in those areas, of, you're not going to be able to metalize either. So you'll have to use some type of an alternative coating, something that's a little more surface tolerant. Uh, if you can get a commercial grade power tool cleaning, you can use an organic zinc rich epoxy primer. If you uh, can't get that, you can only get maybe a, an SP3 regular power tool cleaning, then you would use something like a, a, an epoxy mastic, something sticky, viscous, and that uh, is surface tolerant. Uh, what kind of treatment did you do in the joints and connections for the crevice corrosion and pack rust on that bridge? The uh, standard specification Florida DOT is they also use the same ultra high solids uh, penetrant, epoxy penetrant sealer in those areas uh, because it's, it's got a very low viscosity and it will seep into those areas and seal them. And then as I mentioned before, any, any gap that's greater, uh, 
greater than uh, or less than half of an inch has to be caulked with a paintable caulk, usually a, a moisture cure polyurethane caulk. When was that project completed? That, that project completed. That project finished up about this time last year. In my area, they're metallizing pilings underwater using the coffer dam. Has Florida done any of that? Not to my knowledge. Uh, a few years back, though, I, I did serve on the NCHRP committee that uh, came up with the guide for doing that. Uh, if you want, uh, I'll take your information, or I can get it to Dan, and you can get a copy of that. It's a, it's a very extensive study on metallizing of sheet piling. The round piles. The, the round piles? Oh, the actual, like, like piers. Uh, I don't have any experience with that. But, I mean, if you, if you build the coffer dam, you get the water out there, get it dry in there. The other thing is, like I told you, your, your, your environmental condition requirements for metallizing are much less restricted than for liquid coatings. Humidity and moisture and uh, extreme temperatures are not uh, an issue like they are with your conventional coatings. For F-Dot, you guys put, a, you put the penetrating sealer and then a urethane top coat? And no, the holiday testing was only on the counterweight frames, and uh, they they did apply the full. Actually, I, I apologize, Greg. Yes, we put the the metallizing on, the sealer, and then the polyurethane top coat, and, and then did the holiday testing. Thanks. But, but you know, you pose you pose an interesting uh, thought: is we may want to do the holiday testing if it. If it was a full coat of epoxy, I think I'd agree with that, but if it was the penetrating sealer, wouldn't you still have the peaks of the metallizing exposed? Well, that's the thing. On the counterweights, because they were going to be submerged and because of the, the restrictions, the recoat, we wanted to reduce the recoat window, they used a regular polyamid epoxy as the sealer. They just thinned it a little bit more. Uh, we checked with the manufacturer, and they've actually, that manufacturer has uh, done testing and proven that it works as, as just as well as a sealer that way and it's, it's approved. Thanks Rod, that was really interesting. We've, like I said, we've painted a few, few drawbridges lately and they are some of the hardest projects we've had to do.